Hi all, in today's class we're going to be talking about big data. So a little bit about what big data is, where does it come from, what are the characteristics, and then how can we manage big data using systems like MapReduce and Hadoop. First of all, what is big data? We all know there's been an incremental increase of data over the last few years. If we look back to even the mid 90s, there was nowhere near the amount of data or storage capacity for that amount because simply there was no internet, there were no internet of things, technologies, uh, just way less data collected. So what is data? Where does our com data come from? We have things like logs from telephone companies, you know, Singtel keeps track of whatever cell tower you're closest to at any point. We have logs from websites. Each time you uh, access a website, there's a little server log that uh, stores your IP address, your um, system specifications, etc. There's medical data that we gather from x-rays, there's Fitbits, there's um, so. There's medical data such as x-rays, Fitbits, heart rate monitors, etc. Uh, there's stock transactions, Bitcoin transactions, there's store order data, you order something on Amazon.com, there's email sent out, etc. Um, so I found a little bit of an infograph on the evolution of big data. Let's have a look at that one. Okay, this website, uh, which is a little bit dated, maybe it's from 2013, uh, it gives a little bit of a history of big data, of data, really. It starts at 1919 when the U.S. Department of Commerce partners with IBM, yes, IBM already existed in 1919, to perform an agricultural census. Um, in 1934, IBM's flagship tabulating product, the 405 electric accounting machine, there's a little picture here, is introduced and remains the workhorse of the tabulating industry. Okay. IBM introduces magnetic tapes. IBM guides the Apollo mission in 1969, which is a fr the, the first uh, moon moonwalk. Um, there's a lot about IBM here. IBM introduces relational databases like SQL in 1970. Mm, just picking out some highlights here. In 2007, IBM la launches Lazy Eyes data, visualiz data visualization tool. This is obviously all for IBM. And it sort of stops at 2013. Right, so data has grown incrementally. So even from 2013, ever since then, there's been a huge boom of data. What is considered to be big data? Okay, so I tried to look up some uh, definitions, and this is a paper from 1997 by NASA scientists, and they have the first mention of big data. So they say, it provides an interesting challenge for computer systems. Data sets are generally quite large, taxing the capacities of main memory, local disk, and even remote disk. We call this the problem of big data. When data sets do not fit in the main memory in the core, or when they do not fit even on local disks, the most common solution is to acquire more resources. Okay. So that was back in 1997. Perhaps the most common solution now is to move it up to cloud storage. Um, from around 2008, the term really became popular and it referred to, I just looked up some definitions again, first go to Oxford Dictionary. It's a data of a very large size, typically to the extent that its manipulation and management present significant logistic challenges. Okay. It can also be seen as the belief that the more data you have, the more insights and answers will rise automatically from the pools of ones and zeros. And more commonly also, it's, so we, we see this definition evolve from data that doesn't fit a disk to data that can provide insights and a new attitude 
by businesses, nonprofits, government agencies, and individuals that combine data from multiple sources that lead to better decisions. <clears throat> <coughs> <coughs> So we see this shift here again from data, not just to information, but to knowledge. Data, so what we, so what can we see from these definitions really? Big data is too big to be processed on one machine. It can be in any form, structured, unstructured, semi-structured, as we'll see in a little bit, but lately really refers to predictive analysis and the knowledge that we can gain from this data. So here are some questions for you. What do you think? Most data is worthless, data is created fast, or data from different sources. Data is from different sources and in different formats. Which one of these statements is true and false for you? All right. Most data is worthless is not a common belief. Okay. Even worthless data, data that might seem like it has no use for you at a currently might become interesting uh, in the future when you're trying to find patterns from it that you might not have expected. Data is created fast. It is created exponentially, as you know. Data comes from different sources and in different formats, obviously. Okay. Let's look at some of the applications of big data. Okay. We've mentioned this a little bit in the previous lecture slide, so I don't want to go into too much detail, but let's Let's pick out uh, an example. We have uh, telecom data. I mentioned before, we have Singtel following our phones and even not even thinking about them reading our messages or what we're sending on WhatsApp. We also have the data of our location. Okay. So the location, not just from GPS, but also which cell phone tire tower we're closest to. Okay, so our phone is indirect communication with the cell phone towers, it pings it, and then in the tower there's a log. So all of these systems will face challenges which we refer to as the three V's of big data. Okay. Anybody know what the three V's are is what I would ask now. Um, take a moment to think about it for yourself. Here's the answer. Three v V's stands for volume, variety, and velocity. They're first defined by Laney in 2001 already. These days we see a fourth V, veracity, which is the trustworthiness of data. Okay. So let's go over these V's. So the first V is volume. There's an increasing amount of data. Instead of megabytes, we're handling petabytes. Uh, the very first laptop I had, which was a Toshiba TX1000, had 64 kilobytes of uh, working memory. It didn't run Windows, it ran DOS only. It was a great machine, actually. Uh, but we're constantly evolving, right? So the estimated amount of data in the digital universe in 2010, I found some statistic should be 1.2 zettabytes, which is 1.3 trillion gigabytes. Uh, but this is an estimate in 2010, long time ago. There's way, way, way more data now as it grows exponentially. We have RFID readers, mobile devices, cameras, microphones, everything produces data. Okay. So there's been some people trying to capture just how much data we have. It's pretty much impossible. But uh, Hilbert, for instance, said that the world's uh, capacity per capita to store information has roughly doubled every 40 months since 1980s. Okay. If we look at the cost for one gigabyte of data back in 1980, that would have been 100,000 US dollars. In 2017, it's 0 0.008 dollars. It's even less today. Okay. Now we have to make an, a distinction here between reliable storage uh, and non-reliable storage. Reliable storage is more expensive. What is reliable storage? <clears throat> it is storage that is backed up. Right? If it crashes, your data is not lost. So for instance, a storage area network, SAN, which is different from an SAN uh, sorry, it's different from an NAS, which is a network storage, which 
is like a network hard disk if you have one. So there are hard disks that you can connect to your Wi-Fi and you can access from anywhere in the house. That's different than an NAS. A storage area network is actually a, a dedicated network, block-based, as we'll see later on in this class, whereby duplicates of the data are stored so it can get lost. So that type of storage would be more expensive. So as we said before, most data is useful, so we want to keep as much data as possible. So we need a cheap way to store, read, and process data. Storing on these storage area networks is pretty easy, but streaming this data over a network is a little bit more difficult. Okay. So I found some infograph uh, of data, which is on the URL below, but I copied the images there for you. A nice infograph on the volume of data. So we see the evolution of a bit, single binary digit one or zero to a byte, eight bits in the most basic form, which is one character. Um, two kilobits, kilobytes is roughly a thousand bytes or 1024 to be exact. Um, which is a short paragraph. It goes on to megabytes. Think of a short novel. Gigabytes, seven minutes of HD TV video. Uh, that is if it's not compressed, of course. Terabytes, which is, uh, I mean, you're all familiar with these order sizes. Uh, my hard drive is a terabyte. Um, we're moving on to the area of pentabytes, which would be they say here it's 20 million four drawer filling cabinets filled with text. Okay. 50,000 pentabytes would be the entire written works of mankind in all languages. Okay. But soon in the future, we'll be talking about exabytes, zettabytes, and yottabytes. Okay. One yottabyte is about the size of the entire World Wide Web. Okay. So, interesting here, if we, if we look at storing data, okay, we, this lists a little bit the timeline of um, hard disks, is the most interesting part here to me, I find, is uh, if we look at new technologies of hard disks, which here is the helium filled drives. This removed the, the friction and the fluttering of the plates as they speed, spin at high speed, allowing the drives to have even more space. Some heat-assisted magnetic recording technology is coming up and shingled magnetic recording. Okay. So, so the latter allows the tracks of drives to overlap like shingles on a roof, you know, the tiles on a roof, allowing the hard drives to have more tracks and thus more data. Uh, the heat-assisted re magnetic recording is actually, this allows data to be written more compactly by raising the temperature of the material that can be read by a magnetic field. Okay, so very interesting to see um, this new technology appear. If we have ham hammer drives, then this will easily allow us to store 20 terabytes on a disk. Yeah. All right, so volume of data, there's a lot of data. Mm -hmm. The thing is, there's a lot of data in a lot of variety. So we're storing log sensor data, uh, order transactions, etc. So it varies a lot in how it looks. So there are ma two main ways of looking at data. We can store data in a very structured way, which is predefined. This is something that we would um, be storing in SQL relational databases. So this course is not about SQL, uh, Structured Query Language, uh, which is a traditional structured data set. If you're interested in this, you should take the database class because I could talk a whole course on just SQL. SQL is great for structured data, let's say order transactions. What does structured mean? You know how all of the data is going to look like. For instance, uh, we have, um, order data. You know, for each order, there will be the product name, the date of the transaction, the mode of payment, and the total amount paid. Okay. So this is structured data, and we can store it in an SQL table, which has as column headers all of these uh, attributes that I just mentioned. 
However, unfortunately, in this new universe, 90% estimated of this data is unstructured or semi-structured. So I have a log that um, uh, logs my, um, let's say, website hits. So each time someone visits my website, there's a log entry. It's sort of semi-structured because it has some data on uh, the IP address and the browser, but sometimes that data is missing. So it's not all very ordered. Sometimes there's a line that says no data available. So it's not super structures. The, the amount of columns varies each time. So that's what we call semi-structured. Then there's unstructured data, which may be the content of a website. Okay. Now, we always want to store the original data. Let's say we have a help desk here, help desk conversation over the phone. We might s translate the speech to text so that we can store it more efficiently, way less data, but we would lose information. For instance, in the original aud audio, we'll have the tone of voice, which will tell us something about the emotion of the caller. So something we might want to interpret and analyze later on. So this is where systems like Hadoop come in. Hadoop is something we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, it allows us to store and process unstructured data. So the only way to do that in the past through SQL is by storing data in something called an SQL blob, but it's really hard to process. Uh, so there's way better ways to do that so we can leverage technologies such as MapReduce. So I already mentioned this a little bit. We have structured data, which is an SQL database, um, which is very useful and still SQL is still used a lot and essential in modern day technologies. A lot of websites will have an SQL database at the back end um, because the way they store data on their website might be structured. Okay. We might have, for instance, users that log in on a website. Each user will have a username, a password, date of last login, um, email address, etc. This is all stored in an SQL database. Then there's unstructured data, can be anything, right? This is often something that we're interested in if we're doing data mining. It can be text, numbers, everything. Okay, so and this is where Hadoop comes in. This Hadoop is just one of the solutions, really. There's many solutions. And then we have uh, semi-structured, which might have a structure, but sometimes the, the structure is a little bit different. There's no schema, database schema. Schema is what we refer to in SQL. If, if you have uh, a table, let's say user, then that for each user, you have a name, ID, email, etc. The definition of how your data is going to look like is what we call a schema. So in semi-structured data, these attributes might vary depending on um, your instance. Okay. So in this case, you're thinking of XML or JSON files, which have descriptors for each attribute, so it can be different each time, and which can be typically stored in something like MongoDB. Right, JSON, I mentioned it, JSON files are quite popular on the internet, for instance, as a return for APIs. They don't have a fixed format. However, they define their fields, uh, like the ones I, I mentioned in the previous page. So these, the, these attributes are defined on the fly using a very simple structure. They can even have a hierarchical structure with address consisting of subfeatures. Okay. Well, it's very uh, straightforward. Something like MongoDB will work well as a data set of JSON files. SQL is a relational database. Um, it is usually consists of a number of tables, tables that are related to each other and connected through IDs or keys. For instance, let's have a look at the example we have in front of us. Um, we have, let's say, a room. A room has a maximum capacity uh, and a name. 
here we go, a name. So it is connected to other tables because an event, oh sorry, my pen is not working. Ah, an event can be in a room. So an event will have a booking start and and an event start and end, and it will be in a certain room ID, okay, which refers to the table of rooms. Um, what else is there? Events can have reviews with the review text, which is connected to an event ID again. Okay. So this is what we call keys. Uh, however, SQL is not the, um, the topic of this course. If you're interested, take the database course. Um, Something I just want to mention is that in SQL, what you want to try to avoid is repetition. So when you create your tables, there's something of called the five, um, fifth norm normalization, which makes sure that everything is identical and sorry, unique, not identical, is unique and can be identified using a unique user ID, which is connected to other tables and avoids repetition. This is a very, um, very brief summary of SQL. SQL is also great for transactional data, as I mentioned above. Uh, these boxes in the previous slide can be translated into tables, whereby the, the, um, the features are the column headers. So in this case, we have transactions, probably of purchases, we have the amount and everything always has an ID. It doesn't matter what your table is, you always have an ID. And the transaction will have an uh, amount and it will refer to transaction header. Transaction header, in this case, 266, will refer to this one, which will give you more um, information about the payment types and the GL, uh, the transaction date. Okay. All right. So this is how SQL tables would look like in practice. Very easy to look up. You can just use select statements, uh, you know, select transaction with ID equals five, four, da, 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 from transaction table. That's sort of how you will retrieve your, uh, your data. Any sort of library that you're using, Python, JavaScript, whatever, will have an API for communicating these uh, SQL uh, queries. Then you have Twitter data. Twitter data is um, semi-structured. It will always contain uh, tags. It will have a user ID. It will have the amount of likes. Uh, give me more likes if you want. Uh, there can be number of retweets, etc. However, whatever is in here can vary and not all of the attributes will be there each time. IP logs, again, something that can be very messy. So I would more say this is unstructured data. Okay. And these are logs uh, that are logged whenever somebody accesses a website. So how, what exactly do we mean with variety when we're dealing with one particular problem? For instance, we have a delivery company with trucks. To pick up a new load from a depot, should we just send the closest truck? What data do we look at? This is normally where I'd ask you to think and tell me which data do, should we look at. Okay. Should we look at which truck is closest on a map? Maybe we also want to look at some other things. How about the traffic? Will it get here fast? What about the fuel efficiency? Maybe you want to send the truck, uh, not the biggest truck because you only have a small package. So look at the load of the truck, look at the, uh, the map. Maybe you want to take small roads so they use less fuel. There might be other things to look at. Okay, so. Just solving this particular um, problem will be a very varied data sources. In fact, we sometimes refer to these kinds of data as multimodal. 
because we might have traffic camera data that are images, we might have GPS data and we might have audio data of drivers saying something, I don't know. So our data comes from many, many um, possible sources. Uh, internet, I'm not going to go into detail, all this is pretty pretty straightforward. Government offers data sets and APIs. Uh, there's corporate data, there's Internet of Things. In fact, Internet of Things oh, yeah, will give you a, a ton of data. Wearable devices, home automation from the telecom, tele companies, telecom companies, um, manufacturing data, smart agriculture um, from the public sector. Um, let's say smart parking solutions, they might have data. There's just data everywhere. If you can, so try to find open data so you don't have to deal with any sort of legal issues uh, in the public available data because open data typically is pretty is curated pretty well. If you use private data, you'll see that there's going to be a lot of restraints and restrictions in terms of how you store and secure the data. Okay. And then often we also have government data. In Singapore, uh, government's quite eager to share the data usually, for research anyway. The third V, velocity. The speed at which data is created is uh, incredibly fast. In 2015, which is old by now, uh, they talk about two and a half quintillion bytes of data created that year. Uh, you see it's exponential. By now, we're probably somewhere here. Okay. We store so much data so we can use it for product recommendations, for, for data mining, and to increase our business opportunities. I found a little infograph here, which you can check out on the, on the um, website link here. It's from 2016, so again, way dated. But it tells us in every 60 seconds how much data is created. So let's pick out one. We have about every 60 seconds, right? One minute, 400 hours of videos uploaded on YouTube. Let's see, there are 25,000 posts on Tumblr, 156 million emails sent. I'm pretty sure half of those go to me. There's 3.8 million searches on Google, 350,000 tweets. There's just tons and tons of data. And if you know that it grows exponentially, so these figures are way bigger now. The fourth fee that's sometimes added is veracity. So data can be uncertain and unreliable. So it's actually important that if you have data, you make sure that it's high quality data. Okay. If it's Amazon Mechanical Turk data labeled by some crowdsourced, it might not be the most uh, reliable one. Okay. So that brings us to the fifth V sometimes brought up, which is value. Can you actually use the data? Here you see another summary. So that brings us to something which we refer to as a CAP theorem. You've heard me talk about structured data, unstructured data before, and you, you heard me say SQL, Hadoop, MongoDB. Well, why do, when do we use a certain database over another? To fully answer this question, we'll need to look at this theorem, because what CAP theorem formulated by Eric Brewer says, it's impossible for a distributed data store to simultaneously provide more than two out of the following three guarantees. Okay, so any database system that you will find will only have two of, of these three characteristics. So what are the characteristics? We have consistency. Every read receives the most recent write or an error. Have you ever gone to Facebook you clicked a um, you click the like button and then you refresh the page and your like is not there or you posted a video and you you refresh it the page but it's not there okay 
This is because um, Facebook actually prefers availability over consistency. Facebook, Facebook's database system, uh, I, is it Cassandra? Uh, I think maybe Cassandra, uh, does not value consistency. So that means you and I might see a different number of likes on a post. However, what they do prioritize is availability. We can always load the page. page. There's never an, well, that's a different question. There's never, an, there's never supposed to be an error that the page is not available. Okay. However, the number of likes or if the video is already there or not, that one, the consistency, they don't have. The third one is partition tolerance. Uh, partition here you have to look at. Um, so if the system is partition tolerant, then that means it will continue to operate despite an arbitrary number of messages being dropped or delayed by the network between the nodes. So here we go, we have our different data is stored on different nodes. If a data, usually in a distributed data system, if it is partition tolerant, then that means that um, data A will be stored on multiple locations. Oops, data B will also be stored on multiple locations. That means if there is a partition, and this node suddenly becomes unavailable due to a network error or something, all the data is still available because it will just retrieve it on a duplicated node. Okay. This is a partition tolerant system. Sorry, I think I, I said it wrong before. Partition refers to uh, a, a discontinuity in the network, not the nodes. The data is stored on the nodes, not the partition, sorry. All right, so at any given point, any database system will only have two out of these three characteristics. Um, let's have a look at some examples. Here we see the popular database systems indicated in terms of which of the two characteristics, consistency, availability, or partition tolerance, do they um, adhere to. RDBMS, Relational Database Management System, SQL and the likes, they fall between consistency and availability. Okay, so all nodes are always in contact. When there's a partition, then uh, it just doesn't work, right? So think of this, SQL works well on your computer. It's one single database, it's not distributed. Um, so you always get the latest data and the data is always available. But if there is a, a network error, then there's just no data at all. Uh, CP, consistency and partition tolerance at the cost of availability. Uh, this means, this is a, a setup that, let's say, your e-banking might take. Because what they want to do is, in these kinds of systems, they will, if you make a deposit on your account, Okay, and you refresh the page, they're never going to show you the page or they never should want to show you the page in which your old balance is still shown. So they'd rather show you 404 error page not available until the database is um, available again and prioritize consistency. So you'll always see the correct number, but if there is some problem, then um, it'll just won't work if it's not if the data is not available. Right, and that leaves us with AP. Oh, so sorry, the CP systems are MongoDB, HBase, etc. Popular database management systems. Okay. The final one, which are partition tolerance, so there's duplicates of the data and it's always available. The consistency might be a little bit off, like the Facebook example I gave uh, earlier is a very popular one, say Cassandra, which is also used by Netflix, like buttons and Facebook. And 
in this case, uh, it's okay to show a message late. Uh, you don't have to show the exact message in the right order, for instance. Then you can use something like this. Okay. Okay. So there's a little bit of an extension, or let's say a refinement of this uh, theorem, which is called the Baselk theorem uh, by Daniel Abadi. And it says, if there's a partition P, how does the system trade off availability and consistency? And else, when the system is running normally in the absence of partitions, how does the system trade off latency and consistency? All right. So I think this is a little bit more exact. Uh, this highlights the trade off you know, between latency and consistency we, we, we didn't have before. So a highly available requirement implies that the system must replicate data, right? So replicate data means it, we are storing duplicates of the data. As soon as we have a distributed system that replicates data, there's always a trade-off between consistency and latency. Here's an overview of some of the common database management systems and how they fit into the, this PASELC. Um, some interesting ones to, to point out, again, Cassandra, they'll have partition tolerance and availability, uh, and they will have, and if there's no partition tolerance, they'll have latency, okay, latency over consistency. MongoDB is the opposite, it has consistent data in the absence of partition, partitions over latency. So that brings us but with one particular system that I want to focus on a little bit, which is called Hadoop. Um, Hadoop is not a database system, it's a file management system. And uh, why have I chosen to talk about Hadoop? Because it actually allows us to experiment with this MapReduce technology, which is really fascinating. Hadoop's an open source software framework, uh, which is used for distributed storage. You can distributing your data over multiple data nodes, uh, and processing of data sets of big data using the MapReduce programming model. So it has two parts to it. It has a storage part on a Hadoop file system, which we refer to as HDFS, Hadoop file system. And then there's a processing part to it, which is the MapReduce, which we'll look at in more detail. This is inspired by the Google file system. In fact, the guy who, who named it, Duck Cutting, yeah, Duck Cut Cutting actually uh, came from Google. It's coded fully in Java, although there's all these add-ons in Python and all the popular machine learning languages. Interesting to know that uh, Duck Cutting's son, so this inventor, uh, actually had a toy elephant, which was called, or the boy called it Hadoop, and that's how he actually uh, came up with a name for Hadoop. All right, so how does this thing work? We have a cloud, right? See the cloud on the figure? And the cloud has multiple nodes. Okay. Nodes can be, in a rack terminology, we'll, nodes will be different uh, servers with different uh, hard disks in them. So. We'll store them and we'll get, when we process our data, we'll actually use MapReduce. So there is this thing called Hadoop ecosystem. You can set up Hadoop on your computer. It's not really meant to run on your computer. It's meant to run on a big server with multiple data nodes. Um, but it's very easy to access this cluster using MapReduce because um, it allows you to not just, so there's this latency that you have normally, if you store things dynamically in multiple nodes, usually that means your data is consistent as we saw in the Pascal theorem. However, because it needs to come from multiple nodes in the cloud, it takes a long time for it to be transmitted because what causes delay is this transmission phase. Okay. So what MapReduce is going to allow us to do is to process and reduce the data already on the cloud so that the transmission process is going to happen a lot faster. 
All right, so in the Hadoop ecosystem, we have a number of applications that help people uh, work with Hadoop. <clears throat> we have Hive, which allows you to use SQL-like statements, select all from, ta -ta -ta. Um, and Hive will help you translate this into MapReduce code. Okay. There's Pig, which helps you analyze, so okay, you'll see this is all very animal terminology. There's Pig, which helps you analyze data using simple scripting language. Again, this is transformed into map reduce code. Impala allows you to query data with SQL directly, so not transforming into map reduce this time. Uh, Mahout is a machine learning library on top of uh, Hadoop file system, and HBase, a real time database built on top of the HD file system. So in the lab, we're actually going to be using the Cloudera Hadoop distribution, which integrates all of these tools, so they're all built in already. Here's another uh, example of how uh, the Cloudera ecosystem, which is an Hadoop ecosystem, uh, can look like. So you have different functions. You have store, integrate your data, process and analyze. In this case, um, it's interesting, you can store it in the Hadoop file system ex only, which is what we're doing in the lab. You can use relational databases or NoSQL, um, which is interesting. Interestingly, it's, um, well, this is not a database course, so I don't want to go into too much detail in here, but these are like semi-structured ways of storing your data. All right, so then they have all these APIs and SDKs to, uh, like I just mentioned, to process your data on top of that. Spark is a very popular machine learning lang library as well, which you might come across in your studies. Okay. Right, so uh, this is, looks like an ad for Cloudera, but it's actually just to show you what's in there. So I'm going to give you a uh, virtual machine image from Cloudera. And we're going to be doing some simple map reduce exercises, but you can explore a little bit because everything is going to be pre-installed in that already. So if you want to experiment with some of these other technologies, then you can actually do so. Um, now let's dive into how this Hadoop file system works, the interesting stuff. It looks very much like a normal file system. And again, this is not a, a course on operating systems or something. So, uh, I'm not going to repeat that, but I will tell you that all the data is split into blocks and with a default block size of 64 megabytes. Okay. You can change it, it's just the default. So if we have a file of 150 megabytes, it is split into three blocks, 64, 64, and the remainder. Okay. And each block is stored in a node, simple enough. Let's have a look how this is actually uh, done. We take our 150 megabyte file, this one, oh. Gosh, uh, this one. And it is split into three blocks. Each block is stored on a different node or hard disk in our cluster. Okay. Now there are demons that keep track of where everything is stored. Okay. And we have metadata, which is stored on a name node, which will tell us where uh, the different blocks of this file are. Okay. Is there a network failure? Will, if there's a network failure, will this cause issues? Yeah, it will cause issues. Right, because if part of this network is cut off, okay, sorry, we can't access the last part of the file. Okay. Right. So, what do we do about this? Hadoop has a solution. Okay, we do data redundancy, meaning of our 150 megabyte file, this A block, we are going to store it three times on three different nodes. Same with the B block and the C block, okay. Great. So what happens now if there's a hard disk failure? Any issues? If the network partition is like this, no problem. 
will find all of the nodes actually on either side. However, there can still be an issue. What if there's a disk failure on the name node? It's sort of like losing our index. If we don't know where the files are stored, well, then we can't retrieve them. So we need to do redundancy on the name node as well. So we're going to copy the name nodes and uh, keep a standby name node. Okay. So if there's a failure on this node, no problem. It's not uh, lost. Uh, we still have a copy of it. Okay. Right. So that's it. That's really how Hadoop works. This, the Hadoop file system works. You can set all these things when you set up your nodes. You can set the number of nodes you want to keep. You want, you want, you, you want to set up the number of standby name nodes. You want to have a def different default uh, files block size. That's all possible. So when we have a Hadoop file system on a machine, we always give commands starting with Hadoop. Okay. Hadoop FS, sorry, a little bit longer. Very similar to Linux commands, LS. You know what that stands for. If you do it in terminal, you type LS. It lists the files in your current directory. If you want to store a local file to your Hadoop file system, you'll just use put and you, end, and you give it the file name. You want to rename a file, you just move it to a file with a different name. You want to remove a file or make a new directory. This is very similar to Unix commands. Okay. And if you're not familiar with Unix commands, I actually highly recommend that you uh, spend some time familiarizing yourself with this. All right, and we'll practice these commands in the lab as well. All right, so MapReduce, why do we use it? Um, MapReduce has to do with, if we don't know how to store our files, how do we retrieve the files or process them on the cloud and then retrieve them? When we have a super long text document and we want to process it top to bottom, it's really slow. So MapReduce allows for parallel processing, which is what we want in cloud storage. So here's an example that we're going to be working with in the labs too. We have sales files which are very simple text files, which have a date, a store location, item, and the sales amount. Okay. Text files. So traditionally, if we want to get the total sales per store, so for instance, the total sales for the Miami store, we're going to go to the top of this file and all the way down to the bottom. We calculate, we add it each time a sales sale in Miami occurs. Okay. But what if your text file is one terabyte of data? Which would be the issues that we're facing here? Do you have any idea of this? It won't work. No, it will work. Unless, of course, you run out of memory. Yeah, this is a very very likely possibility. It will take a huge amount of time, but it will give you the right answer. Okay. So in Hadoop, we're going to be transferring or working with key value pairs and using a hash table so that we can actually do parallel processing. I'll explain more how this will work. So we have our sales and the here the key value pairs that we're interested in is the store and the amount because we want to have the total amount of sales per store so that's going to be our key and our value the first step in our first step we're going to do the map task we have two task maps and reduce in the map task we have multiple mappers And each of the mappers, we're going to break the, um, the file down into different chunks. So instead of one huge text file, we now have multiple files, blocks really, which are stored on different name nodes, as we saw above. So this is the setup that we have in Hadoop. Each of the 
each of the data nodes, sorry, data nodes, have a mapper. So we have a mapper, a mapper, mapper, mapper. Okay. So each of the mappers will look through the data that they have and they will make nice piles. They will make piles per store, which is our um, key. So on each of the data nodes, we'll get piles per key. Mm -hmm. Great, that's all that happens. This is our map task, easy peasy. Then we have the reduce task. The reducers, you can specify how many reducers you, you use. This is not related to the, the number of data nodes. Um, the reducers, they each get assigned one or multiple, one here for sake of being easy, one key. So what are they going to do? One reducer is going to knock on the door of each of the mappers and say, give me all your pile for uh, my key. So the first reducer here is going to ask here, give me the, your pile for New York City. Give me your pile for New York City. Give me your pile for New York City. That's what they're going to do. Interestingly, when they give the pile, all these piles are sorted alphabetically or per numeral or etc. You can actually choose the sort key. Right. So then in parallel, other reducers are going to retrieve their piles from the mappers. Okay. And then you give them the reducers a, a, a task in this case, get the total sales. And that's it. That is the map reduce task. And when they have the total, they'll pass it through to you. So now we see that our network traffic has significantly reduced. Instead of passing one terabyte of data, you're only passing the totals per store over the network because the calculations actually happen on the nodes. Right. So you have your big data, which we store in a Hadoop file management system. The mapping and the reducing happens in the cloud. The useful data is in the cloud and the trans transfer copied to local is only the useful data. This is what makes MapReduce so powerful. All right, so there are these demons active uh, in MapReduce. Demons, as I already said, demons sort of keep track of um, what is what is where. So we have, for instance, a job tracker. A job tracker splits the work between the mappers and the reducers. So they'll keep they'll manage your map reduce job and make sure everything gets executed. We also have task trackers. The task trackers actually run on the data nodes themselves, and they actually execute the actual mapping and reducing. Okay. So like the job trackers are the managers and the task trackers, they actually uh, execute the job. Okay. Um, that's pretty much uh, the summary of MapReduce. Did I forget anything? Also, mappers perform filtering and sorting and will pass the intermediate data to the reducers and then the reducers process this. In this case, we have some operation and they pass along the final output. Okay. So this is MapReduce explained quite briefly. In the lab, we are going to uh, perform actual MapReduce. I've prepared a virtual machine for you. So you are going to have to install the virtual machine using something like VBox. Do not try to install Hadoop uh, in your own machine. If I can remove this option, because we end up spending two hours in the lab setting up Hadoop, which you will not need for any of the other labs. Okay. Um, so check out these Google instructions and it'll show you how to install the virtual box. Okay. I will go over some of the MapReduce in the next uh, lecture slide and in the lab with you together. Now, did you pay attention to the class? Um, let's have a look and let's fill in the form 
attached here, which is a little quiz, and it'll help you get some more uh, feedback about uh, if you understood the lecture, if I explained correctly or not. All right. Thanks for your attention, and I'll see you in the lab.